Before we start, I know the joke in the thumbnail is lame, but I've been waiting to make that joke ever since the movie was announced, so you're just gonna have to live with it. Thank you. Kagi Sama Lovers War is a series I've wanted to talk about on this channel for a little bit now. For those not in the know, the series revolves around Kaguya Shinomiya and Miyuki Shirogane and their exploits as they attempt to trick the other into confessing their undying love, only to fall in their faces or have their hilariously intricate plans get messed up by their chaotic friend Chika Fujiwara. Yeah, I think that's as spoiler free a summary of the show I can give. It's a series that I will admit took a minute to hook me in, but by about midway through season one, I was in love with it. Any attempt at making a video on this series has been blocked by a couple of things, having more pressing matters on my mind or not really being sure I had anything intelligent to say about it. But with this movie, I'm throwing that concern out of the window because I loved it. First I want to note that I went to see this in theaters as it happened to be showing at my local theater on the 14th. Yes, I went to see a romance anime by myself on Valentine's Day. What of it? The experience of laughing along to a movie of one of my favorite animes with a bunch of other nerds was definitely a worthwhile one, except for the bit where the projector stopped but the sound didn't so we missed about 5 minutes in the movie because it was in sub. Thanks for that Cineplex, it's this quality assurance that keeps us going back to your theatres. However, before we discuss the movie further, a cheeky Patreon plug. The Michael and Lo-Fi Patreon will not only get you early access to my videos, but you will also get an inside look as to the process of making these videos. This includes clips from work in progress videos, stuff that doesn't make the cut of existing videos, audio bloopers, and even the notes I take when watching content for this channel. On top of all that, you'll be able to lodge video requests, so if there's something you'd like me to cover, you can tell me and I will put it on the list. There might also be polls for what you want me to do next? That seems like fun. So not only will you be getting all this, but you'll also be supporting this channel, for which I would be very grateful. So swing by my Patreon. It's a little sparse at the moment, but once I get into the swing of things over there, it'll be much more interesting. Hopefully. So anyway, the movie. It's awesome, man. In my mind, this movie had a lot to live up to. Season 3 of Kaguya Summer Lovers War <laughs> was to me the best season yet, so this movie had to live up to the expectations set by that season. And oh man, did it live up to and clear those expectations. For a start, this movie was funny as ever. It seems that being in movie form rather than for TV allowed the writers to go a little further with the humour, and as a result the comedy presented in this movie was quite a bit raunchier than the show in places. The shock of that alone led to laughs aplenty, but it also worked perfectly in the context of the story being told, so it was all pretty funny. But what really struck me was how heartfelt this movie was. My heartstrings have not been so tugged at, I guess is the metaphor I'm running with, since the end of season 1, when the gang took Kaguya to see the fireworks. See, in summary, this movie is all about the immediate fallout to Kaguya Shinomiya and Miyoki Shirogane's kiss at the end of the third season, and the complicated emotions it pulls out for both of them. The movie particularly focuses on Kaguya, and her battle with her love for Miyuki and the cold personality she's had to build to protect herself. It's actually this conflict that really prompted me to talk about this movie, but we'll circle back to that in a moment because that's more spoiler heavy and I'll try to keep this in a non-spoiler slash spoiler section kind of video. The point I'm making here is that it was heartbreaking stuff, and damned if I wasn't moved close to tears multiple times throughout the film. Now visually, this movie might be a little less impressive to some, it pretty much looks like an episode of the anime in terms of visual style. However, this doesn't really bother me all that much. The anime itself is already pretty nice to look at, and given that this movie is a direct continuation of events in the series, I think it would have been a little jarring to stray too far from the visual style of the series, so it's not something I even actively thought of until I saw another review say they didn't really care for that aspect of it. In fact, stylistically the movie does follow the sort of formula of a car gear episode, shorter little vignettes that all add up to one whole. Again, I think this works. It's a formula that served the series well overall, so the way I see it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Ultimately, I think this movie will be stylistically exactly what you might expect from a Kaguya Sama movie. The wow factor is all in the storytelling, and honestly that's pretty much what I was hoping for from this movie. Now, by the time this video will be out, I dare say that the limited theatre release will be over, so unfortunately I cannot advise you to run to your local and watch the movie post haste. However, I can say with assurance that when this movie does come to Crunchyroll or wherever it'll be available to watch once it has a broad streaming service release, it is every bit the follow up to season 3 that I hoped it would be and more. Even as I type this out, I'm tempted to watch it again. It's just such a satisfying ending to this particular plot thread, and it only leaves me more excited for what the fourth season will bring to this anime only fan of Kaguya-sama. Quick thing I think is worth noting before I go any further, I saw this in sub as the dub is is not out yet. This is worth noting because the sub and dub of this show are very different experiences for a couple of reasons, and may even shape your enjoyment of the series. I personally love both. I prefer the chaos of the dub as it feels very authentic to high school shenanigans, but the voice acting in the sub, particularly that of Aoi Koga as Kaguya, is just on another level. This continues to be the case in the movie. Over the movie, Aoi Koga is playing several different sides of Kaguya, and she commits to all of them perfectly. That said, I'm still looking forward to the dub, because everyone involved in that is also awesome. 
especially Alexis Tipton as Kaguya and Jad Saxton as Chica. Also, the dub narrator Ian Sinclair is gonna go nuts on this movie, and I can't wait for that. Anyway, that out of the way, here on in, it's going to be spoilers galore. So if you haven't seen the movie, chuck a like on this video and come back to see the rest once you have seen it. Or keep watching if you don't give a shit about spoilers. I will get one thing out of the way pretty quickly, and that's my thoughts on how this movie is structured. Now in the anime, each episode generally consists of two or three sections that deal with little battles between the characters. Be that between Kaguya and Miyuki and their schemes to get each other to confess, or shenanigans where the characters play games, squabble, or just plain mess around. This movie more or less follows the same concept, containing several shorter chapters that tell their own little stories. Now these little shorter chapters are all connected by the common thread of Kaguya and Miyuki dealing with the fallout of their kiss, but they all have definite beginnings and endings of their own. Which makes sense because each of these little chapters roughly correlates to a chapter of the manga as it was initially serialized in Shoeisha's Jump magazines. In a way, it can feel at times like several episodes of the show have been edited into one 95 minute presentation. Now I don't consider this a bad thing at all, in fact, the little graphics presented in between the chapters add a nice sense of levity to the proceedings even when the subject matter is getting a little heavy. Really, the only drawback of this decision is that it includes a chapter involving perfume that I found wasn't quite as funny as the rest of the movie. It's just worth noting as all because it's not as straightforward a three-act structure of an anime movie as something like Mugen Train might have been. My initial instinct was to break the movie down into these chapters and look at them individually, but I don't think that would serve the movie very well in terms of criticism, so I'll be a little more general than that. Now, of course, one thing I will judge this movie on is its sense of comedy. The show in of itself is exceptionally funny, both in sub and in dub. The original subtitle version combines zany shenanigans with the deadpan wit of the narrator, whereas the dub version allows everyone, including the narrator, to be as goofy as possible. Of course, I saw this movie in sub, so as of yet, I don't know how the dub will handle the comedy of this movie. But in the original sub, this movie is still pretty hilarious. As I mentioned earlier, the comedy of this movie gets quite a bit saucier than the TV series in places. Now, the series comedy can already be pretty randy. Even by the third episode, there was a gag about Kaguya misunderstanding what the term first time means, leading to several very rude jokes. But in this movie, they let loose pretty quickly to hysterical results. It's all very rude indeed, but still manages to be so in a way that makes sense. The humor is around a bunch of awkward teenagers who have no idea what the hell they're doing when it comes to relationships. There's the occasional gag that comes out of nowhere, like one where Chika's menace of a little sister Moeha gives Miyuki a set of handcuffs for Christmas. What the fuck? But it's most mostly done very authentically. Beyond that though, the movie does remain true to the series' observational humor surrounding the exploits of its main characters. There's inherent comedy in the awkwardness and misunderstandings that these characters have, and they continue to be used to great comic effect here. Some of the jokes might seem simple, such as Kaguya saying to someone that the I'm asking for a friend excuse is infantile, only to cut to Miyuki using that very same excuse, but they still land every single time. They also bring back several jokes from earlier in the series, but then expand on them in even funnier ways. My favorite example example of this is the character of Dr. Tanama, the world famous doctor. In the series, he's brought in as a gag to explain the severity of Kaguya's lovesickness for Miyuki, the chief joke being that it takes the world's best heart surgeon to diagnose Kaguya with down atrocious. His setup in the movie is much the same, but then is expanded in a truly hilarious way when it's revealed, in a very matter-of-fact manner by the way, that he fooled around enough in high school to end up being a teen dad, a joke that becomes even funnier when a character we know is revealed to be his grandson and probably on his way to repeat his grandfather's mistakes. It's all very silly stuff, but the movie's extremely deadpan revelation of all this information made for one of the biggest laughs in the theatre. But most of all, the thing that makes this movie's comedy work is its balance. At the end of the day, the main point of the movie is something very serious. Two people trying to figure out where their relationship stands after a massive step taken. Undercutting this too much would have hindered the emotional stakes of the movie, and the comedy of this movie avoids doing that and often actually works hand in hand with the more serious elements of the film. The return of Dr. Tanama is hilarious, but it also helps to move Kaguya and Miyuki's reckoning with their emotions forward. Conversely, a moment where Kaguya insults Miyuki's coffee brewing skills is an icy stab to the heart, but it leads very naturally into a joke about how Chika is always stuck teaching Miyuki new skills. The balance really helps to even out the movie, and to make it all the more a rewarding emotional experience. In this manner, it is in fact a joke that ends up setting up the stakes for the entire movie. What do I mean by this? Well, in the season 3 finale, it's revealed that Kaguya ended up Frenching Miyuki when they kissed. Frenching. 
That's how you use that, right? In the episode, this is presented as a passing joke, like ha ha, Kaguya doesn't know much about kissing. And to begin with, the movie plays it up for comic effect, but slowly the comedy around it begins to drop. It's not funny to Kaguya, and this sudden realization triggers her doubts and insecurities that will be investigated across this entire movie. For the most part, this is a very Kaguya-centric movie. While the struggles of the other characters are touched on from here to there, except for poor Chika, who doesn't get much to do this time, the battle within Kaguya's mind is very much the front and center of this movie. Throughout the film, her insecurities and traumas are explored in a few different ways, using imagery that is sometimes immediately obvious and other times quite subtle. The more obvious approach to depicting Kaguya's emotional battle is of course the use of different versions of Kaguya battling for order and control in her mind. This has been done before in the series, going back to an episode in season 2, but there it was used largely for comic effect. In this movie, the humor is all but gone, allowing for a really serious look at the turmoil in her mind. In summary, there are three main personas to take into account. Little Kaguya, who represents the more cheerful, emotionally impulsive part of Kaguya, Ice Princess Kaguya, the cold, collecting, scheming side of her, and the neutral Kaguya, well the one we generally know from the series as a mix of both of these. However, the neutral Kaguya is largely pushed to the side for most of the movie, and as a result, we spend most of it with one of two extremes of Kaguya's personality, the bubbly side and the cold side. It's not particularly subtle imagery for how off-balance Kaguya has been thrown by the kiss, but it doesn't have to be to be effective. In fact, it's the simplicity of this imagery that really helps us to understand what exactly is going on in Kaguya's mind and how well she's coping. In, in short, not well. To begin with, little Kaguya is running the show as a result of Kaguya being sleep deprived and not really having enough energy to put her usual emotional walls up. Then, as she sleeps, her internal battle is shown to us in a courtroom scene, where an argument between the personas results in the Ice Princess version of Kaguya being the one we follow for most of the movie. Now, from the series in general, we understand that Ice Princess Kaguya used to be all that people knew of her, that the more balanced version of her we see in the main series is a result of a lot of growth from being around people who really love her. So when we see Ice Princess Kaguya back in control, we immediately understand that she is regressing. The kiss has brought a lot of very complicated emotions to a fever pitch, so to cool off she runs back to her old habits, hiding in them to protect herself and, as she believes, to protect Miyuki as well. I will come back to this by the way, because there's a lot of really tragic stuff going on with Ice Princess Kaguya that I need to pull at. Now, to drive the movie forward narratively, this persona imagery is already some pretty good stuff, but it's backed up by a couple of other nice details, one of which took me an embarrassingly long time to put together in the theatres. The first of these, the more readily apparent one, is to do with Kaguya's hair ribbon. This red ribbon is a very easily identifiable part of Kaguya's character design, enough so that at least one person in the audience for my showing had it in as cosplay for the character. But for most of the movie, this key part of her design is missing. Now, on one hand, this works as a very nice visual cue for the audience. In all the flashbacks and courtroom scenes, Ice Princess Kaguya notably does not wear the ribbon, which seems to be in aid of making her look a lot more severe. So when she takes it off after waking up from her internal courtroom battle, it is a very effective way of communicating that the Ice Princess is very much on the house. I mean, the ribbon turning its surroundings to ice seeks to drive that point home with a sledgehammer, but it was a very pretty shot, so I won't complain. The more interesting thing to me is when the ribbon comes back and how. As Ice Princess Kaguya is in the forefront for most of the movie, she doesn't wear her ribbon until right at the end after the Christmas party, when she and Miyuki finally air out their anxieties and share a quiet moment with each other. As the two finally find themselves in a more comfortable place, the warring emotions in Kaguya's mind also return to the balance that we've known across the series. Ending the scene with her putting a ribbon in her head, the character design trait that's been missing all movie, places a nice little bow on the whole thing. Look, you can't hate me for that pun. I didn't even plan that one, that just happened. The point is, emotionally and visually, we know Kaguya's found peace with her emotions at last. The other thing I like about the return of the ribbon is that, initially anyway, it isn't the red one we're more familiar with in the series. Instead, it's the cloth from the box that Miyuki's Christmas present to her came in. As I'll dig into later, this present is representative of Miyuki's own anxieties about himself and the things he tries to hide from other people. He'd been stressed out that this present would cause Kaguya to reject him as being stupid, so when she not only accepts the gift, but takes part of it as herself, it sends two messages. That of the ribbon showing that Kaguya is back, and that Kaguya truly, wholly accepts Miyuki as he is. It's honestly really beautiful. After all this about the ribbon, I don't have much to say about the other little piece of imagery I picked up on in comparison. This other recurring visual motif is the moon, or rather the visibility of it. Over the series, the moon has already been an integral part of the show's imagery. The name of Kaguya and the love story involved is pulled from the Japanese folktale of Kaguya Hime, the celestial princess from the moon who falls in love with the emperor. The result of this is that the moon pops up pretty frequently in the show, the folktale even being actively referenced by the characters on at least one occasion. The movie continues in that trend in a really interesting way. In the movie, the moon is often 
often shown as being obscured by clouds, only really being fully visible on a couple of occasions. These occasions tend to line up with moments where Kaguya and Miyuki are being open and honest with each other, making it a sort of visual indicator of the relationship. When the moon is obscured, Kaguya is hiding from Miyuki and herself, but when it's in plain sight, she's being fully open with nothing to hide. It's a simple thing, but it took me till the end of the movie to piece that one together, so make what you will of that. I've talked about Ice Princess Kaguya already and what her essentially her role is in the movie, but now I want to dig a little deeper, because there's quite a bit going on with her too. Earlier, I mentioned that the icy Kaguya represents a sort of regression for Kaguya, one of running back to old habits to protect herself from a lot of very big and very scary emotions. But to understand why she'd do this a bit better, we need to understand how Ice Kaguya came to be, and the effect it's had on her life. Most of this is already pretty well spelled out by the movie, but I want to highlight it because I want to praise the approach the movie takes to some very sad subject matter. In short, Ice Kaguya is a trauma response. Growing up, she was consistently told by the people instructing her to hold herself to the values of the Shinomiya family, and that everyone around her was less than her. This is what her father wanted her to be, so she molded herself into the perfect Shinomiya heir, pushing down the side of herself that manifests as little Kaguya. She put so much effort into this mask that her loving side almost never showed completely unfiltered for much of her life, only appearing when she was too exhausted to maintain the icy mask. By the way, this has been alluded to before in the series to a lesser extent. In a season 1 episode, the more neutral Kaguya is thrown off balance when she's sick, becoming what the movie depicts as little Kaguya. But what's more interesting to me about Ice Kaguya is the self-destructive loop that this side of her falls into. She behaves the way she was taught to by her parents, treating people with cruelty because it's all she's ever known. Deep within her, the kind side of her knows that she's hurting people, but then internalizes this as believing she's just a terrible person. As a result, she doubles down on her cruelty to push people away, isolating herself in an attempt to protect everyone around her from ever getting to know her. And more than anything, I have to praise the writing involved in this aspect of Kaguya's life and personality for being real to a gut-wrenching level. The character the type of my parents didn't hug me so I lash out at other people is reasonably common in media, but I find it's never expanded on in a manner that really feels anything more than surface level. But this movie does. It peels back layers that have been alluded to across the series and gives us a complex look at the effects of trauma and isolation on youth, and how detrimental it is to making meaningful connections. It's also devastatingly real. I'm not out here to make this Michael's mental health hour or anything, but in pulling apart this aspect of the movie for this video, I found that a lot of Kaguya's self esteem and isolation feel startlingly familiar to my own past struggles. So placing something I relate to on screen in a deep, meaningful, and sympathetic manner, yeah, that hit home. It's also extremely tragic to see the extent to which Kaguya regresses into Ice Kaguya. It's implied that to begin with, she used to be little more than frosty to the president, but now as she tries to hide from her emotions, that chilliness becomes even harsher. On the more mild side, she runs tests on Miyuki, seeing if he'd hold her hand in the cold, for example. <laughs> But on the more extreme side, she resorts to insults and even physical violence to push him away. This is another occasion where a running joke from the show becomes something much sadder too. The running joke of Miyuki thinking that every plan of his will end in Kaguya calling him adorable in a condescending manner comes back as Kaguya regresses. And this time, as she calls him cute for not picking up on the clues that she was laying down for a test, there is no humour. Instead, it's like an ice pick to the heart. But what I think is most vital here is that the movie makes it plain that while Kaguya is regressing, the growth she's had over the past three seasons doesn't magically vanish. She has to put effort into keeping the mask up, often actively lying to herself in the process. She pushes Miyuki several times to kiss her again, trying to make him think that she thought nothing of the kiss that started all of this. But she's lying to Miyuki and herself. She has to convince herself that it meant nothing if she's going to be able to hide behind the ice persona, and in saying this, it helps to push Miyuki away. The hand-holding test is also evidence of this. She tells herself that it's a test to see if Miyuki is suitable enough as suitor for the heir of the Shinomiya family. But it's clear that it's also a part of her trying to reach out from under the mask, to hold the hand of the boy she likes. I imagine had Miyuki taken her hand, it would have melted the ice wall somewhat. Is that conjecture? Maybe, but it also feels right. As I noted earlier, I relate to Kaguya's self-isolation in this movie. So, speaking from personal experience, it makes sense that someone who's pushing everyone away will also, paradoxically, try to reach out. It might not even be a conscious effort, but despite their self-destructive spiral, people who do 
do this don't really want to be alone. They just think that's how things should be. And ultimately, the heart of the self-destruction for Kaguya, as it turns out, is extremely simple. At the end of the day, she doesn't believe anyone can actually ever love her if they knew about the darker side of her. She pushes Miyuki away because she believes that he can never love this side of her, and that she'll only ever hurt him. However, as it turns out, Miyuki feels exactly the same way about himself. While Miyuki's trauma doesn't get nearly the same airtime as Kaguya's, it's still established well enough that everything he does in the movie makes total sense. His mother walked out on his family when he was young, and Miyuki believes it to be because he didn't do well enough in school to justify his mother's attention. Whether this is actually the case isn't clear, Miyuki could have just internalized her walking out as his fault and worked around to blame it on his grades, but the net result is clear. He believes that he has to be perfect in order to be loved, and works himself towards that perfection until he's ready to drop. When this is revealed, it becomes obvious that the two are reflections of each other. Both see themselves as unworthy of love, it's just their responses to that feeling that differs. One pushes everyone away, the other tries to be loved by all. They both wear masks, but with opposite purposes. It's a deadlock that was never going to give unless one of them made an active move, and fortunately that move came at the Christmas Eve party. I mentioned while talking about Kaguya that I believe her hand-holding test was her trying to reach out from under the ice mask. While in the same vein, Miyuki does the same thing with his Christmas present for Kaguya. The movie establishes that Miyuki intended on getting Kaguya the perfect present, but ran out of time and bought her an admittedly very nice kendama instead. Because Miyuki believes that everything has to be perfect for Kaguya, he believes this present to be very silly and tries to bail on it in front of Kaguya. But the thing is, he still brought it to the party. He knew if he did she'd see it, and I imagine part of him knew that she wasn't going to let it go once he brought it up. It may not have been totally conscious, but he managed to reach out to Kaguya, and from there the two are able to finally work out where their relationship stands. Furthermore, as I noted earlier, his worst fear is proven wrong. Kaguya accepts him and his gift entirely, even tying her hair up with the cloth that came in the box. This scene also addresses something else to do with Kaguya and Miyuki's masks, and that's the irony surrounding how they've influenced their relationship. Throughout the movie, these defensive masks have hindered Kaguya and Miyuki in meaningfully talking about their relationship, but they also come to realize that these masks are how they came to be in each other's orbit in the first place. It was Kaguya's icy nature that initially got Miyuki's attention, as he'd immediately understood that it was more out of self-defense than a sense of cruelty. If it weren't for Miyuki's drive to be perfect in the eyes of everyone he meets, he wouldn't have gotten Kaguya's attention. Kaguya notes that, now that they've met, they can reach out to one another for support. You'll continue to work yourself to the verge of collapsing, she says, but when you find yourself tired and weary, won't you come rest a little while with me? She knows she can't make Miyuki pull down his defensive wall entirely, but she doesn't want him to have those walls up with her. Not only is the scene beautiful and touching, but it's also really healthy. Kaguya and Miyuki have a very frank conversation about where their relationship is headed, setting themselves up so they're on equal grounds with each other. I imagine the latter half of this video more represents a sort of word vomit than it does any coherent points. I mean, I hope it makes sense. What I guess I've been trying to say across this video is that this movie really connected with me on an emotional level. Not only did I get a painfully realistic look at self-esteem and isolation, but I also got to see the payoff for three seasons of watching two characters I deeply care about figure out how they feel about each other. If there's anything I've learned from this show, it's that apparently I like a good romance, and oh boy is this series, and by extension this movie, a good one. I don't imagine that writing the beginning of this relationship was easy. After all, we've been following these characters for a while now, and we know them pretty well. We've just had the kiss on the roof at the culture festival. Expectations for what's to come next for how they actually enter this relationship must have been sky high. I know when I saw the tag at the end of season 3 where Kaguya and Miyuki were holding hands in the student council room, I thought for a second, huh, that's it? So having this movie to fully flesh out that immediate aftermath more realistically and authentically to the characters was definitely worth it. And now, three seasons in a movie later, Kaguya Shinomiya and Miyuki Shirogane are together. Season 4 is just around the corner, and more than ever, I cannot wait to see what the future holds in store for them. I mean, I could just read the manga.